So the question is, and I get this all the time in the Men's Health Center, I am a family practitioner. I practice family medicine for 20 years, but more of the conversation came to me about male sexual function and men who were concerned about their ability to develop, keep, and um, sustain erections. And this was before the, the, uh, the availability of Viagra. And I was very concerned that this symptom of erectile dysfunction and inability to fill the penis was somehow related to an increase in overall male mortality. That those men who came to me with um, erectile dysfunction had a greater incidence or a greater risk of dying of a heart attack or stroke. And I wanted to make sure that I um, investigated them or did a workup to potentially prevent another heart related or, or neurologic related death. So the question is, why do men die earlier? And is it because they're risk-taking? Is it because they smoke? Is it because they do dangerous professions? It's probably, to be honest, all of the above. These are my disclosures. I work for a couple of pharmaceutical companies uh, as a consultant and investigator, and I've been on multiple American Urologic Association um, guideline memberships panels where we've developed guidelines for erectile dysfunction, testosterone deficiency, and Peyronie's disease, and now prostate cancer. But the gender differences and mortality and life expectancy vary throughout the world. Um, yet in most countries, men live shorter lives than women. In Russia, that difference is, as you can see, 13 years. In the U.S., it is five years. And this is an advertisement that somehow spoke to me, but it's a place for mom. And you see this advertisement all the time on television. However, there's never a place for dad because all of the dads or grandfathers are dead by this age, and it's just women. And there are companies and efforts to try to care for those individuals. But what's behind this male-female gap in life expectancy? Is it unhealthy behaviors, higher smoking, heavy drinking, gun use, employment and hazardous occupations, risk-taking, um, higher rates of lung cancer, accidents, and homicide? Again, all of the above. Genetic factors aside, men um, what can we do to help men live longer? And that's to seek medical care earlier. Um, one out of four men do not have um, an established relationship with a primary doctor. Um, modify risk factors for heart disease, reduce smoking, lose weight. Modify risk behaviors screen and treat depression and pay attention to early family history for, for signals of what's to come. And of course, what Mark Moyad always professes, which is diet, exercise, and prevention of type 2 diabetes. So let's look at specifically obesity and the cardio potential cardioprotective effects of treating erectile dysfunction, treating testosterone deficiency, and uh, recognizing these in practice. I'm first going to talk about a case. And this is um, this case is about TD. He is a 50-year-old male man who I just saw recently father of two adolescent children, boy and a girl, 16 and 15. He provides in-house counsel to a large corporate finance firm in downtown Boston. It's very stressful. He's working 60 hours a week, 
but it's less stressful than his prior life, which is prosecutorial work. His wife is also a corporate attorney. He's noted a two-year history of progressive, intrusive fatigue. He fatigues more easily. He's distracted. He finds himself napping during the day because he's working from home. Um, he pre it prevents physical activity. He no longer wants to get in the gym twice a week and do his martial arts. His libido is gone. He finally, at his wife's urging, started seeing a psychotherapist. And he was shortly, about three months ago, he was started on antidepressant therapy um, and, and serotonin, um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Zoloft or Prozac. And he was also given another medication, bupropion, because it helps to potentially um, negate the effects that these medicines have on male sexual function. What these medicines do that are so typically prescribed by primary care doctors is that they cause erectile dysfunction and they um, prevent libido. So he was anxious and depressed. He was really fearful of what was going on in the, in the world politically and the war. Um, he's gained 30 pounds during COVID. And his past medical history was positive for high blood pressure. That's the only med that he's on. And elevated lipids, but he's not receiving any treatment. He was found as part of his fatigue workup to have obstructive sleep apnea, which prevents him, um, which stops his breathing at night. It's He's snoring loudly, and then he'll stop breathing for a short period of time. He did this several times through the night. It was recorded, and now he's awaiting CPAP therapy. However, because of CPAP is a, par, a positive pressure system forcing um, oxygenated air into the lungs to keep him breathing at night. Many men and women use CPAP, but because of the difficulties with uh, production, he's been awaiting a device for CPAP for nine months. Um, his meds include a medication for blood pressure called Losartan, which is a very good medicine. It's um, it prevents, um, it's not associated, one of the few blood pressure medicines that are not associated with male in, in, increased male sexual dysfunction. He's also placed on amlodipine. Oftentimes you need two medicines to adequately control male blood pressure, oftentimes three. He was given propranolol, which is an old medicine which slows the heart and is used more frequently these days for anxiety in low doses. And he was this medication called um, ezetivalopram, which is he's using for his generalized anxiety and depression. You can see that his vital signs reflect that his blood pressure is elevated. 148 over 91 is high. It should be below 120 over 80. His pulse is 84. That's a little bit rapid, but he's this is the first time in his office. His height is 5 feet 11 inches. He weighs 268 pounds. But what's most significant is most of this weight is called visceral adiposity, meaning that his waist circumference, which is taken at the belly button, it's 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 a waist a tape measure that's taken around the belly button. It's forty six inches. It should be less than forty inches. So most of his weight is in his belly, and his body mass index is thirty seven. He is considered morbidly obese with marked visceral adiposity. His labs reveal that his total testosterone is 160. His um, re repeat testosterone, total testosterone was three, 204. So what that means, his normal male levels of testosterone range between 300 and 1,000. This man's testosterone was below 200 on one occasion and just 204 in another. And he has signs and symptoms of low 
testosterone or what we call testosterone deficiency. The luteinizing hormone, which is, is measured, is sent from the pituitary gland deep in the brain to the testes to stimulate the release of testosterone. His LH is 4.6, which means that he is making luteinizing hormone and stimulating the testes. However, the testes are not responding because the, um, of this visceral adiposity, this belly fat. It's causing a lot of inflammation and decreasing the release of his testosterone. What's very important here is his A1C. His A1C is reflective of his last 12 weeks of glycemic or glucose control. It is elevated. A normal A1C goes to 5.7. His is 6.1. We use an A1C to make a diagnosis of diabetes. This man has pre-diabetes. His A1C would be 6.5 on two occasions for him to have a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, but he's already halfway there. What's important is because of his belly fat, his obesity, he's 50 and he's already pre-diabetic and likely to become diabetic. He has low testosterone and his um, total cholesterol is 226, which is above 180 the desired goal, and his HDL cholesterol, which is his good cholesterol, is under 40, which is 38, and that also puts him at risk. His LDL cholesterol is above 100, which is the desired goal at this time. It's 155. That's his bad cholesterol. And his risk ratio of total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol is 5.9, greater than 4, so he's at risk of a cardiovascular event. So this man needs to lose weight. He needs to begin exercise. He needs to continue the medication that's helping his anxiety, but he needs to get his body in shape. And he's here to see me because his primary complaint was that he had no sexual desire. He had no sexual desire. His Testosterone deficiency is manifested or, or supported by the following symptoms. Low sexual desire, a erectile dysfunction, he cannot sustain erections, and loss of spontaneous erections and a difficulty in arousing. It takes him longer to become, um, to to become aroused when stimulated, and it takes him, um, he has an inability to keep his erections. So he came to me with these issues, but you can see that his life is characterized by a stressful job, poor sleep, the presence of high blood pressure, obstructive sleep apnea, elevated bad cholesterol, low good cholesterol, low testosterone levels and um, um, hypertension. So manifested uh, in, the, in his two presenting signs and symptoms, which is low sexual desire and an inability to maintain an erection. So we're not going to talk about treatment of this man, but I I can see that this would be a really fascinating topic to talk about whether you use testosterone, how long you use testosterone, um, for what period of time, what are the safest forms of testosterone therapy? How do you monitor an individual during testosterone therapy? Um, why use it? Um, I think that would be good for another discussion. What I wanted to talk about today was obesity. That man was severely obese, yet that man is, I see 24 to 28 men a day, and that man is one of the 20 similar patterns that I see day in and day out. The prevalence of obesity in the U.S. is, um, is overall 40%, 40% of adults. And what's most striking 
and most fearful is that by 2030, we're going to see that prevalence increase to 60% in this southern belt. We're going to see that prevalence close to 50% throughout the country. There are very few spots, if all, at all, where the prevalence of obesity will be less than 20%. We defined obesity by a, a body mass index of greater than 30. You can see that gentleman that I talked about before had a BMI of 37, but obesity is present far below that. And why is it important? It's important, as you can see, it has numerous concomitant comorbid medical conditions, elevated blood pressure, elevated LDL cholesterol or low density, um, lipoprotein cholesterol, a lowering or a decrease of HDL cholesterol, poor quality of life, sleep apnea, type 2 diabetes, stroke, and heart attack, and death. This slide is important because with the benefits of 5 to 10% of weight loss, in that man alone, 10% would bring him down to 250 pounds. He would still be significantly obese, but that 10% would improve his, his reduction of his type 2 diabetes, a reduction of his heart mortality, an improvement of his lipids, improvement of blood pressure, improvement of his sleep, and improvement of every quality of life aspect that he would experience. Not only is that man at significant emotional distress, that man is at significant um, heart risk. He is the father of two adolescent children, and he's at significant risk of sudden death from a heart attack. There's a psychological burden of obesity that includes eating disorders, anxiety, depression, quality of life and body image, stigma, discrimination and self-esteem. Um, that man feels guilty about his weight. He feels that he's too, he's too sluggish. He feels that it's because of his behavior. And the truth is that he's eating more because he's anxious and he's eating at irregular times and he's eating at night when other people are sleeping, because that's when he's most anxious, but he's not eating out of hunger. If he tries to go on a diet, and this man has dieted all his life, he will lose weight for a short period of time. He'll get to the gym on a regular basis, but then he feels hungry. If he doesn't eat, if he doesn't start to restrict carbohydrates, this man feels hunger and he craves carbohydrates because that's what's the primary portion of his his intake so the use of testosterone and i put this one slide in here because there are people who believe that testosterone um, repletion and you see these t centers which qualify or call themselves men's health centers throughout the country these for-profit testosterone centers. And what we can see from the development of these centers and men's willingness to use hormone therapy just for um, improving overall quality of life is um, driving the sales of testosterone even with some of the concerning studies that were published in 2013 and 2014, which really do not preclude the use of testosterone, but were concerning because they were associated with an um, increased risk of heart attack and stroke. But it's driving the, the prescribing of testosterone almost fivefold over this 10 year period of time. And it is not the single answer. And urologists or these T-centers that use these meds do not understand that these meds also decrease fertility in men and can cause, and cause their endogenous production of testosterone to cease from working. 
And urologists who give men testosterone, 25%, this is how much is not known about testosterone therapy. 25% of respondents said they would treat infertility with testosterone when in truth, testosterone causes an infertility or the prevention the prevention of the secretion of testosterone from the anterior pituitary gland to the Leydig cell of the testes, which makes testosterone. The Sertoli cell of the testes makes sperm. So what are the alternatives in this man and other men and men of all age to increase their testosterone to what are the alternatives to testosterone therapy? Those alternatives include, and I call them natural therapies, diet and exercise, improved glycemic control, weight loss, improved sleep, stress reduction, and varicocele repair. Varicoceles are um, engorged or enlarged veins in the scrotum, and they're often fixed by urologists in the workup of infertility. This is a study that was published to examine weight loss on men and exercise. And one of the things that we're told all the time is that men need to lose weight. And I say this all the time, men need to lose weight. And if they want to increase their testosterone, they have to lose weight and um, increase their exercise. Well, these men were, oh, 44 obese men were um, given an, uh, an exercise regimen three times per week for an hour, three times a week, and diet of a almost 1,700 calorie diet a day. We saw an improvement of their blood pressure. Their systolic blood pressure dropped um, from 114 to 101, and their testosterone improved by 25 nanograms per deciliter. So if it was 275 before, it went up to 300. That's not a lot. That's not a lot. And the truth is we don't have very good lifestyle studies to show that an, a good lifestyle um, improves testosterone. But this was um, the European study of the aging male. And this was, um, it's a very large study, a longitudinal study of almost 12 years in, in um, housed in Britain that looked at 3000 men and assessed changes in weight and testosterone levels, as well as sexual function and exercise and, um, and male symptomatology with testosterone levels. So we learned a lot about aging and about aging men and testosterone levels from this study. This is a study published in 2013. What this study shows is that weight change and testosterone levels are not um, inversely related or, or proportionately related, that it's a sinusoidal curve. And what that says is that the weight change um, the greater the weight change in men, the higher their testosterone levels will rise. So if these men had lost 15% of their weight, they would raise their testosterone levels by 240 nanograms per deciliter. If they lost um, a greater than 10% decrease in, rate, in weight showed about a 100 nanogram per deciliter increase in testosterone. So the greater the weight loss, the higher the increase in testosterone. I thought this study is one of my favorite studies to raise to men. And sleep, if you look at the issues of obstructive sleep apnea, and sleep deprivation, you see that men with obstructive sleep apnea have a much higher prevalence of testosterone deficiency than men who do not. And the greater the degrees of what we call nocturnal hypoxemia or 
what happens as men stop breathing at night as they're trying to sleep, they have an oxygen saturation that drops reflecting a hypoxemia or low blood oxygen. And this predicts a lower testosterone. So men, 12 men who underwent a uvulo um, palatopharyngealoplasty. It means they review, they removed the back of the hard palate in the, in the um, throat. And they took this out to pre- reduce the risk of, of the tongue interrupt falling back on the trachea and interrupting sleep during, and these men who had severe obstructive sleep apneas. So this is not a procedure that's done often. It's not done on most men, but it's done on men who have severe obstructive sleep apnea. So they studied these men and they found that those men who underwent this procedure had almost a hundred milligram, a nanogram per deciliter improvement of their testosterone. So when you're talking about levels between 300 and 500 in that low normal range, those normal those levels will increase. And men um, who have the lowest levels of testosterone are at the greatest heart disease risk. We have found a number of studies that show that. Again, a different talk for a different day. But men who have their testosterone normalized also appear to have an improved um, reduction of that cardiovascular disease risk, an improved diabetic control if they're diabetic, and an improved sleep. Sleep deprivation. All the men I see every day, um, and I live this for my first 30 years, 40 years of life, restricting sleep to five hours or less, decreased testosterone levels by 10 to 15%. What's most important is that when sleep is restricted during the first half of the night and permitted for um, later in the nocturnal rhythm, that those men show no significant change in their levels. However, those um, men who underwent a total sleep restriction of five hours a night or less that were found to have significant decreases in serum testosterone. So I think what when Mark and I were talking last summer, the most exciting thing for me to see was the approval of a group of diabetic drugs called GLP-1s or glucagon-like peptide agonist type one. These medications were approved in non-diabetics for weight loss. And this was the first time that drugs of this quality and drugs of this safety were approved for weight loss by the FDA. Each individual's Preset weight is determined by a genetic set point, that person's DNA. It's called a metabolic set point. And this set point is based on a combination of genetic history and personal biology. This this group of medication that was approved by the FDA in August of, of 2021, GLP ones are hormones made by the body to tell the brain to decrease appetite, to trigger fullness and improve metabolic function. And it's aligned with an individual set point. Um, These medications um, work with the body's natural hormones to reduce this metabolic set point and over time reduce body weight. Obesity is very complex. These hormones, Um, um, are now, a couple of these are FDA approved and they're safe. And they have been in use since 2005 for type two diabetes. This is um, a group of, um, this is an example of some of the medicines that are available these days for weight loss. 
The first is Orlistat. Orlistat is um, a medication that works to bind fat. It can cause diarrhea. Um, it by itself can reduce weight up to 9%. Placebo, as you can see, is very strong and was 4%. This is a medication that I've never used for weight loss called naltrexone and bupropion. Naltrexone is a medication that's used in treatment of individuals, of course, who have um, opiate uh, ODs or, um, or abuse. And bupropion is an old medication used for the treatment of, of depression. And this has and shows you the weight loss improvement potentially is about 3.7 to 1.7%. And then a medication called fenteramine and toprimate, which is a, a medic. It, these are a group of medicines that have been approved by the FDA for weight loss in the past that use um, what's called sympathomimetics. They increase the metabolic activity in the body. The trouble is they elevate blood pressure and they cause vasoconstriction, and they cause tachycardia, an increased heart rate. So they're not um, they're not say completely safe to be given in individuals who are most likely to be obese and have elevations in their blood pressure and weight. And this is a medicine called liraglutide, which is uh, Victoza is the brand name. It is a medication used to treat diabetes mellitus. And this was one of the first studies that showed that liraglutide um, also decreased weight about uh, by about 6% when compared to placebo. But what you see here is that these medications are expensive. They've been approved for diabetes for, like we said, for many years, but the, at this point, they're just beginning to be approved for um, weight, the treatment of obesity. And of course, this barrier of greater than $1,000 per month retail cost is the greatest barrier to these medicines today. Um, insurance companies simply don't cover them as of yet that I am aware of. But they increase this endogenous production of GLP-1, a, a hormone that promotes insulin secretion, that decreases glucagon and decreases appetite, slows gastric emptying, creates sat a sense of satiety or fullness. Patients who are increasing their GLP-1s, these medications are given subcutaneously, meaning that they're given by an injection and usually have an auto injector that they put up to the belly and give themselves a shot once a week. Um, patients are slowly increased on their um, the amount of the medication over weeks, and these individuals lose weight. Weight loss is independent of the ability to reduce glucose levels. And therefore, these medications don't induce what we have often experienced before with medicines to treat type 2 diabetes, and that's um, low glucose levels or hypoglycemia. And what's most important and most exciting to me is that these medications improve heart outcomes they reduce heart attacks, they reduce stroke, and they reduce kidney disease. These are all the pharmacologic effects of these medications. You can see they in decrease cardiovascular risk, they um, decrease inflammation, they decrease blood pressure, they decrease body rate, they increase insulin secretion, they decrease gastric emptying, and they um, increased liver insulin sensitivity, which is very, very important. These are the step trials. And these are the trials that preceded the um, approval by the FDA in 2021 for this particular medication, which is called semaglutide. Semaglutide is this injection once weekly. Um, 
And in this group, it's given to individuals with obesity, with um, out type 2 diabetes, in this group with type 2 diabetes, in this group in conjunction to treatment of their um, with um, intensive um, behavioral therapy, meaning exercise. And what you find with these medications is that um, men who use these men and women who use these medications lose up to over 15% in comparison to placebo of 2.4%, over 15% of their body weight with um, up to a year after beginning. And this is individuals with type 2 diabetes because this was a lower dose. These are individuals with intensive behavioral therapy which means exercise and limiting caloric intake. And you can see up to 18%. And those individuals sustain that weight loss, as you can see, when they reach the maximum amount of the medicine and um, continuing throughout 68 weeks, which is over a year and a half. So semaglutide once weekly um, leads to improvement of type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. Those men normalize. It reduces inflammatory markers as they lose weight. It improves their quality of life. And it's found to reduce their incidence of cardiovascular events by up to 14 to 17%, which is very significant. Um, this is the ongoing trial that's studying these, these cardiovascular events because these studies are much longer term. Um, the incidence of heart disease, the incidence of kidney disease, um, these studies will st are still being, um, uh, we're still looking at individuals in these studies um, to, to make, to ensure that they too have those similar cardiovascular benefits that are seen in um, patients with type 2 diabetes. So what we're trying to do, and I, I uh, the point of this talk today is really that we're trying to establish a center of treatment for men, evaluation and treatment for male sexual dysfunctions, erectile dysfunction, low testosterone. So we're looking at developing a holistic center to reduce the incidence of sleep apnea, of, of fatty liver disease, of arthritis, of a hypertension, of coronary artery disease, of type 2 diabetes. We're trying to what we call macrovascular complications, and that's death, and the microvascular complications, which include the loss of their, their sexual function, their low testosterone. We're trying to treat that in a way that's holistic, that involves lifestyle, weight reduction, and medication, and medication. So, um, and that includes stress management. Um, the last study I wanted to talk about, because I found this to be really interesting, was published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology this past 2021. It was a Swedish study by Anderson, and it involves, it's a retrospective study. So studies that are known as cross-sectional studies, studies that are, are either looking at data or groups of populations of individuals in the past retrospective or in the future prospective studies, you can do these large cross-sectional studies and you can find associations, but you cannot say that they're causal. So a lot of the things that come out, um, this medication causes dementia, this medication causes um, um, risk of cancer. All of the, most of these studies are associations, meaning they're done in cross-sectional studies, retrospective or prospective studies. And there are, um, there are some studies are of course better than others, but these studies um, can show associations between X and Y, but they can't say that X causes Y. 
So this was a retrospective study of a large number of Swedish men with who were on these oral therapies, meaning oral Viagra or Cialis, oral therapies for erectile dysfunction, or treat, compared to men who were treated with injections, because that was the way we had treated men before the release of Viagra in 1997, injections into the penis, and they all had a history of coronary artery disease. So this is a high risk group for recurrent heart attack and stroke and death. The mean follow-up of this study was about six years, and there were 2,261 deaths out of that 16,000 group, 14% in the um, the PD-5 group, meaning the men who had taken the oral medications, and 26% in the men who had injected medications. So what does this study mean? It meant that the, the men who were taking the oral medications had a lower mortality, um, almost a reduction in 12% in mortality compared to the men who were using the injection therapy. And that was also true for their heart failure, their incidence of re recurrent heart attack um, and um, stroke. So the group, the, those of us in, in the know, those of us who look at this and are interested in this for counseling our patients, believe that these meds like Viagra or Cialis or Levitra, these meds actually um, improve blood flow into the penis and the penis is like a balloon. It's just filled with two vascular poles, two, two strong vascular poles that are very small arterials that dilate five to ten fold. And as they dilate, they fill with blood. So with arousal, there's a release of this nitric oxide gas. These medications dilate. Um, I mean, these, these, these vascular bundles dilate and men have an erection. And the way that these meds work is that they prevent the degradation or the breakdown of that gas and thereby improve the ability to fill the penis. So men who take Viagra and Cialis or Levitra, they actually lower their blood pressure, even though they might have more flushed face, they lower their blood pressure because they're vasodilating throughout their body. And these may improve survival by augmenting the lowering of blood pressure because these meds lower blood pressure by a mean of about four to six millimeters of mercury. Um, and frequent sex, men who, if you look at the groups, the men who injected or the men who um, were using these meds may be um, more sexually active and therefore frequent sex qualifies as a physical activity, although it's not, it doesn't count as exercise guys. So don't, don't confuse that. It, it does qualify as physical activity, which promotes longevity and the use of these meds certainly can restore that. And that may restore the benefit, but, um, and we also know that deteriorating general health is associated with a decrease in sexual desire and activity, meaning people, if they're not feeling well, they don't want to make love. And therefore, a higher exposure to these meds may identify, have identified healthier and more sexually active patients. So these are all the issues that came up when you looked at the study but this study shows that men who take these medicines, and there are several studies now that show that, that men who take these medications may improve their overall mortality, may improve their reduction in heart attacks and strokes. So I thought that was fascinating. So in conclusion, what I wanted to hit on today was that the male longevity gap is real. It's real, and all you have to do is look at the aging population to see that. Um, it's multifactorial. It's based on genetics and behavioral factors. The principal reason for 
early male death is cardiovascular disease. One of the manifestations of cardiovascular disease, early undetected subclinical disease, is that men have erectile dysfunction and um, may or may not have low testosterone. That cardiovascular disease is modifiable, that risk factors can be reduced, that obesity is the single most modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular disease, and semaglutide, a GLP-1 agonist, was recently approved for weight loss in non-diabetics, and that it achieves between 15 to 18% weight loss, which is also only attainable with bariatric surgery. And in Dr. Moyad's mind, in my mind, this is a game changer. And it may offer cardioprotect and that oral um, treatment of erectile dysfunction with PD-5 therapy, Cialis, Viagra, um, which is Tadalafil and Sildenafil, may offer uh, cardioprotective effects to diminish heart disease and improve survival in men. And this is our desire in Men's Health Month, which is to improve survival in men. Thank you. <laughs>